Uh, it require a, a more aggressive regimen of supplementation to get it up to normal levels before you go on the maintenance dose. So now we've learned about the vitamin D defense strategy. Right. Um, so if you're caught naked anywhere, just tell them about <laughs> the vitamin tell them D you're problem. Right. <laughs> My vitamin D level made me do um, it. So just a reminder of the audience, please don't ask personal health questions. Uh, we'll start here. Hi, I'm Michelle Tisi. I practice primary care in San Francisco. And I just wanted to ask a, a question about what you were talking about, diet and cooking. One of, I grew up in an Italian-American family, learned how to cook. My brother and I went off to college. We knew exactly what we needed and cooked all the time, just for sake of saving money. So when I was going to med school, I wanted to be a neurologist. But when I learned how the primary care in the, st in the United States is so poor and people don't have the common education of cooking and things like that, I went into primary care. So the burden a lot is on the healthcare providers, and I think our burden is to catch disease early, but I really think that we need to go to education and teach people how to cook, and, and they need to see nutritionists. I mean, they should, nutrition should be required education in the U.S., as well as, you know, physical education. So how much of that is being worked on? You know, if we want to really change things. I, I don't think it's being worked on. I think that would be a great priority. I remember when I was in grade school, uh, there was a class called Home Economics for the girls. <laughs> Me too. I always wanted to go to that. They got to make brownies. I got sent to wood shop and had to make a broom hole. <laughs> you know, I think we should look at that. I mean, why should, you know, why, why did we think that way? And do they I think it should be for everybody. And I, if I, yeah, if I may react, uh, I completely agree with you in spirit. But as a health and vitality is a single sandbag. If it's a program in a school or a program in a work site or what clinicians can do with their patients, we're one part of a comprehensive solution. I, really, I don't think it's realistic with all that we have to do dealing with our disease care or disease management system that we will be primary educators about the details of cooking. I think we could hand out recipes. I think there could be creative collaborations between clinics and progressive uh, innovators in, in the culinary arts who could help us know what simple, wholesome, delicious recipes we might hand out as a routine part of office practice. But I think the education you're talking about should be something every kid gets in school, whether it's home ec or whether it's, you know, it, it's food and living, and it's not just for the girls, it's for everyone. We should also have adult education that teaches parents the value of engaging kids, as your parents obviously did you, and mine did me, and we do our kids in cooking. Because kids, you know, I think, the, are we all parents? We probably all agree, you know, kids are much more willing to try food the healthy food we want them to try when they were involved in preparing it. So that there's a real benefit there. You have real leverage. Because no, I'm seeing people at 30 years old and 60 years old, and I'm sending them to the nutritionist because they don't even know how to read the label to check if there's... Uh, one of the, for the action items that I have in my forthcoming book is to create an office of health education within the Department of Education. And that to, to have real, creative health education <laughs> mandatory. And I would love to see that the training in cooking and food as part of that, and that's something that I'll work for. Yeah. I think physicians can be consultants to that, as David said, I, but that's not their job. I would right. say that there's a larger ecosystem uh, change happening. We were just with, uh, two weeks ago, the heads of the National Park Service, and they started a health and national resilience project um, that's going to put uh, farmers markets and organic farms within the national parks. As a matter of fact, the White House is the first national park with a garden in it. The very first one, thanks to some Chicagoans who are there now. So I'm going to go over here for the next question. I can talk loud enough. It's on. It's on. on. It's on. It's on. Uh, Scott Emerson, I'm an emergency physician and medical toxicologist. And uh, I'm just getting involved in this, and uh, just a series of comments. One thing our current health system does well is trauma. Uh, they've, they've got that down. But you're right, with the chronic diseases, when you look at something, even like the insulin that's produced in this country, what do the pharmaceutical industries do? They throw away the C-peptide, which we know now is very important in preventing diabetic nephropathy and peripheral neuropathies. Why is that happening? Because there are other drugs in the pipeline that they are going to be using that they can sell to people to prevent these complications, and there's a profit motive there. It's really scandalous when you, when you start looking at the big picture here. And something you guys uh, all hit it around was uh, the idea of 
of spiritual fasting. And there's a spiritual dimension to preparing food. And um, I look at a three-day juice fast or a four-day juice fast as a way to kind of put the defibrillator on the taste buds. It really does reset the, the whole uh, idea of, of, of what you're used to. So then you start with a fresh slate, and then you can appreciate very quickly. Uh, it, it's almost like shock therapy for your taste buds, so that when you, 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 you don't have this weaning or gradual process of getting all this processed food, you can move now into really appreciating the, the fullness of, of whole foods. So would you guys like to comment on the, uh, you mentioned that the famine never comes, and, and, and that's true in our culture. Uh, is spiritual fasting a part of uh, balanced nutrition on a, a semi-annual basis or even an annual basis? My, my perspective is it, you mentioned several interesting topics, but yes. to respond to that one. Uh, I think it could be, I don't think it has to be. I think there are many different ways to rehabilitate taste buds. Incremental progress to a more, to help, more, more helpful diet, focusing on taking sugar out of places it doesn't belong. But for people who are inclined in that direction, judicious fasting or juice fasting, I, I think is perfectly fine. And, and if it functions the way you describe, and, and for some people in my experience it does, it is the transition. I'm going to make the commitment. It will, it'll be a seminal event in my life. It'll be the beginning of the rest of my life. And you know, I'm going to basically purge my taste buds of their previous ills and move on. There are certain hazards to non-judicious fasting, uh, you know, where people binge afterwards. And so it depends on the person. It depends how it's done. I think it's one of many potential strategies to say, I'm, I'm leaving the habits that were weighting down my health in the past and moving on to a more healthful future. If it serves that purpose, I think it's all right. If you look at things evolutionarily uh, from a perspective. We, we, can we, we need to move on yeah. to the next person. Thank yeah. you, though. Can I just make a comment about the, what we were talking about, the role of physicians in all of this? Uh, I do think that physicians could be very powerful advocates for change in this area, both of government, food policies. Um, they're not equipped to do that now because their training uh, omits this kind of information. The Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine in our fellowship trainings includes a very strong training in nutrition. Uh, we're also developing a fellowship for registered dietitians, and uh, one of our missions is to create a new generation of health professionals who are really up to speed in this area. Now, I feel very strongly that one of the reasons that things are as they are is that physicians have, have abdicated this role because they weren't trained. I mean, that's one reason why 40% of our hospitals now have fast food restaurants on their premises, you know, which is how can you teach anything if right in your facility that's going on? Um, you know, there's so much that has to be done, and, and uh, physicians are looked to as authorities in our culture. It's very important that they get up to speed about nutrition and health. Can, can I just say yeah. one? I want to uh, carry on with that topic as well, because I really don't think that n no matter what basically nutritionists and, and physicians say in our culture, it's not going to create the culture of, yeah. of health in our country. It's every one of you in this room making something delicious and sharing the recipe with all of your neighbors mm -hmm. and your friends and your coworkers. That's what's going to create that culture, uh, certainly yeah. the food side of the culture. You get people excited about it, and the next thing you know, people can't imagine it being any other way. And that's yeah. what it takes, not somebody telling you, you should do this, right. you shouldn't do that. So I, we're, we're all agreeing in response to the primary care perspective, doctors should be part of the solution but the notion that much of the solution to living well resides right. in a doctor's office is misguided. Right. Right? That's not where much of this action will play out. So we're, we're down to our last 10 minutes. I'm going to ask the audience members' questions to be the lightning round. Just ask your question quick so that we can get through a bunch of them before we're over. That way. OK, I'll try to be quick. I just want to say my mother, I'm very fortunate. She was a nutrition and um, HAMAC major at the U of A, and she spent her life trying to teach children nutrition. And my great-grandmother uh, came over with a head full of recipes, never used a recipe in her life. Uh, her no, daughter published a cookbook. So we, we definitely have in this country the culture. But um, the HAMAC program was abolished in our very wealthy western suburban area up here because it was felt that philosophy classes would get the children into more competitive schools. Now the children don't know how to sew on a button or cook a meal. So 
Um, and I'm a full-time uh, Parkinson's disease care manager because, well, for a number of reasons, but um, the whole idea of nutrition is never brought up in the doctor's office. So um, it's more of a comment, uh, and I, I hope that you all will use your position of extensive power to try to reintegrate uh, home ec and other very unglamorous things into our society as they once were, and to, as thank goodness for Dr. Weil and other like-minded individuals, uh, try to bring up the unglamorous topic of nutrition in the physician's office so we as family members do not have such a, in, an enormous burden on us to do everyone's job. Thank you. If I may, Tara, um, in response to getting nutrition into schools, for example, when they don't have time. You know, we, we have to, and the problem is much bigger than uh, we have to teach philosophy. It's no child left behind, which by and large has left all the children on their behinds because we've jettisoned <laughs> recess and phys ed. So for those of you who have an interest, we have two, out of my lab, we've developed two free programs. We have tested them both. I'll be discussing them at the conference over the next few days, but we'll be publishing papers on the very compelling uh, scientific results, but they're available free and they take minimal time. Nutrition Detectives is an elementary school nutrition education program, requires two hours out of a school year and significantly enhances the ability of children and their parents to identify more nutritious food. And ABC for Fitness is the analogous physical activity program. It stands for activity bursts in the classroom. It divides physical activity up throughout the day so the kids get it whenever they need it. And we've actually provided that in a format where teachers can teach while doing this, so it actually increases teaching time. The most exciting thing to say about that program, we've tested it, it improves fitness and all of that. 33% reduction in the use of medication for ADHD in our intervention group. The remedy for rambunctiousness in children is recess, not Ritalin. And, uh, I, I have to say, as someone who, who grew up with ADHD and does startups in Silicon Valley, we would have no Silicon Valley without ADHD. <laughs> and so, All right, well, we want to keep some of it around. Then. So um, here, and if we can keep it to quick questions, really, instead of comments, just because there are a lot of you and we'd really like to get through all of them. Thanks. Thank you for this informative forum. What is your take on dairy, the dairy industry and dairy? Uh, that's complicated. I'll try to give a real short air answer. Um, you know, the dairy industry has gotten itself into a position of great power in influencing dietary choices in this country. It started to do that in the 1920s by supplying very high quality educational materials in the form of print and film strips free to public schools, which had a hidden agenda of getting people to be lifelong consumers of cow's milk. Uh, slogans like, you never outgrow your need for milk, are pretty strange considering that every other species rapidly outgrows its need for milk, or that you know, milk is nature's most perfect food, which I'm sure it is for baby cows, but there are a lot of questions about being it right for adult humans. There are three problems with milk. The sugar in milk, lactose, is indigestible by most people in the world, except for people of northern European descent. If you stop drinking milk in infancy, you lose the enzyme that enables you to digest that. That sugar is broken down when milk is converted into yogurt or cheese or fermented products. Uh, the fat in milk, butter fat, is one of the most saturated fats in the diet and a major source of excess saturated fat in the American diet, mostly in the form of cheese and very low quality cheese. Uh, you know, it's the, the processed stuff. And the protein in milk, uh, casein especially, um, is an irritant of the immune system and a key factor for people of certain genetic background, which is a lot of people, in diseases like childhood eczema, allergies, bronchitis, chronic sinusitis, and so forth. There are a lot of problems with the dairying industry in this country. I'm not saying, I, by the way, I like cheese, and I eat good quality cheese. That's part of my diet, and I sometimes eat yogurt, although I can't find yogurt I like in this country. I like yogurt from India and, and the, the Middle East and Greece. Um, the, uh, just briefly, you know, aside from the use of antibiotics in cows, uh, the, the use of bovine growth hormone, and it really bothers me that Americans have been so complacent about all this. In Canada, where I am a part-time resident, uh, when, it was try when people tried to use bovine growth hormone, Canadians were up in arms about that, and the pro pro it was banned nationally. 
You know, Americans don't seem to care about things of that sort. Um, but just one interesting area of research that I've been following that is worth knowing about. There is a very um, bright physician. She's a Mongolian woman at, on the faculty of the Harvard School of Public Health who has been researching differences in dairying practices in Mongolia and North America and relating that to differential rates of cancer, of hormonally driven cancers. Uh, in America, we have gotten into the habit of keeping cows in almost constant states of pregnancy and lactation. That's not natural. Uh, so that they're producing milk almost all the time. As a result, their bodies are flooded with sex hormones. These are natural hormones. And those hormones get into the milk. In Mongolia, they don't do that. So there's, they have about a third of the amount of milk that we do. So they make do with less milk for part of the years. There are dramatically different rates in prostate cancer and breast cancer in these populations, which she relates to that. That doesn't matter whether you buy organic milk or non-organic milk. Mm -hmm. It's that this is a result of unnatural practices of raising animals, which goes back to what you were saying at the, right. we were talking about at the beginning, about how this may be related to the generation of flu viruses. That doesn't mean milk is bad. It, it means that it's, it's been foisted us on a, in a way with tremendous pressure from the dairy industry. In the recent revision of the food pyramid from the Department of Agriculture, the dairy industry managed to get the recommended servings of dairy up from three, which was originally proposed, to four, yeah. purely by their lobbying efforts. I, I agree with all of that, at, at, at risk of failing to understand yeah. the rules of the lightning yeah. round here. Uh, the, the one thing that I, I agree with all of that, and, and actually, Andy, you started out by saying it's complicated. And it's complicated not just because yeah. of all that history, which you know so well, but because there are pros and cons. And, and just to put a, a pro out there, I, I think the peddling of, of dairy has been excessive. Uh, to the point even where a three-a-day campaign started to confuse people about the five-a-day campaign, which was supposed to be about fruits and vegetables. But we do have trials like DASH, Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, where non-fat dairy in particular, or low-fat dairy, combined with a mostly plant-based diet, actually appeared to be superior, at least in terms of blood pressure reduction, relative to a mostly plant-based diet without the dairy component. So, you know, for those of you who are inclined to consume dairy, I think by and large, non or low fat is preferable. Uh, and organic is preferable. Uh, it may not completely eliminate the hormones, but that combination is powerful. Organic will largely mean you'll be free of the synthetic hormones. And if you skim out the fat, a lot of these hormones are fat-soluble compounds, so a lot of them will go out with the saturated fat, which you don't need anyway. Uh, one other fact that you may not have heard, but it has been repeated at these conferences in the past, the populations in the world with the highest dairy intake have the highest rates of hip fractures in the elderly. And also the populations that have the highest calcium intake have the highest rates of hip fractures. That you may not have heard that before, I invite you to research that. Uh, but as an epidemiologist, I have to point out that societies with the highest rates of per capita television access have the highest rates of hip fracture too. So <laughs> well, they, they, not, they, they not may be true, true, and unrelated. Not incompatible. So, um, be because uh, we're being respectful of the time, especially with Mother's Day, um, I'm only going to be able to take two more questions here and there from the audience. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Albert Schweitzer, working with a very evolved physician, was cured of his type 2 diabetes eating vegan and raw. I wish you'd speak to raw versus cooked, understanding, I, I fully understand that some things like legumes and Brussels sprouts are not nutritious unless they are cooked, but that is below 145 degrees, maintains the micronutrients. Thank you. Okay, I, I'll give you a very quick answer to that. I think that, that an all raw food diet is silly. Uh, and the reason for that is that the people promoting all raw foods diets, the two main reasons they give are that cooking breaks down enzymes in food, which they say are vital for optimal health. Stomach at, dropping foods into stomach acid is at least as violent a transformation as cooking them. And all enzymes are broken down into amino acids and stomach acid. They have no function in human nutrition. Secondly, 
the uh, number of key micronutrients, and this is particularly true of the carotenoid pigments, are much more bioavailable from cooked versions of foods than raw versions of foods. You get much more beta carotene from cooked carrots than from raw carrots. Lycopene, which helps prevent prostate cancer, is available from cooked tomatoes, not very well from raw tomatoes. So for those two reasons, I think the philosophy underlying all raw foods diets doesn't make sense. Uh, in, on practical terms, I've eaten in a few uh, very high-end raw foods restaurants, which were interesting experiences. I mean, it was interesting. But it's a very labor-intensive way of food preparation. Uh, and also, I, it seemed to me an immoderate use of nuts in, in this kind of food. So, you know, I, I, think, I think an optimum diet should include a mix of raw food and cooked food. That's I agree completely, and to append one example, Eggs contain a chemical called avidin, which deactivates biotin, which is a nutrient we need if you eat the eggs raw. If you cook eggs, it denatures avidin, making the biotin, which is an essential nutrient, available. Just as one example that sometimes adding heat to food enhances its nutrition in interesting ways. So there are many foods that can be eaten raw. Not every food should be eaten raw. And there's certainly a one-size-fits-all notion that, that enhances the quality of diet, I think, is misguided. One last question. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Weil, Dr. Katz, and uh, uh, Mr. Bayless, thank you so much for coming to this very timely conference um, to Chicago. Um, I come from a culture of seasonal eating. And um, being here in Chicago, I get to be in a local foods market only about uh, three months out of the year. So um, besides going to the local uh, food markets and moving to the West Coast to grow my own little garden, um, what are some of your tips, tricks, and resources for seasonal eating? And along with that question, I had a, um, a lady who um, you know, added an extension to this question, what can we do to um, you know, be active in the legislation um, to make you know, the changes in the government that you have discussed previously? Well, I would just say that um, the, we have a 12-month farmer's market here. so. I, I don't know what the three-month section of that was because we go 12 months of the year and you can buy local seasonal products from many different places and our restaurant uses 12 months of the year local, locally raised things. So um, maybe it wasn't the case a few years ago, but certainly now you can do that. You have to change your diet in the winter. That's the big deal here. And that I, I for one, really welcome that change in the diet. Um, I love eating sort of a lot more raw foods in the summertime when we have a lot more of those vegetables that lend themselves to that and a lot more cooked things, especially slow cooked things in the winter time. Um, but we have major storage crops around here because it's a great place to, to grow all of the root vegetables and we have a lot of uh, small farms around here that are doing hoop house spinach in the winter all winter long, some of the best spinach you'll ever eat in, in your life. So I, I think it's mostly, my recommendation is is find those places. We actually have a number of farms here in Chicago that do um, CSAs that they will deliver to you 12 months of the year. And they'll bring you storage crops, they'll bring you the greens that they raise in those hoop houses and things like that. So it does require sort of ferreting out who's doing it, but the more of you that ferret it out, the more other farms will do it. And we have seen just an explosion in it in the last five years, especially in Chicago. And now that the Green City market is a 12-month market, um, we're really finding a lot of farms that are saying, hey, what was I doing just uh, growing six months a year? I now know because other people have taught me how to grow 12 months of the year in this climate. People used to do it up until the 1940s. They did it in this climate all the time. Now uh, we are not used to it so much, and we think of it as a short growing season, but it's easy to go back to the other. And many of our local farmers have figured that out. Hmm. Really nice. Anything on uh, what, can, what can we do, which I think is a really good question. Well, I'm a big fan of fermented foods. Uh, I make my own sauerkraut. Yep. I like Japanese pickles, uh, which they make from uh, foods like turnips and carrots. Uh, those are great in fall and winter, and you're eating living cultures of microorganisms, highly digestible. Uh, so that's one strategy. So the well, follow-up follow question, the the, follow -up question yeah, was, what, legis, can, what, what can you do about legislation, legislation and what's happening? And certainly, I think, um, Andy, might, yeah. we might want to mention the farm bill issue. Yeah. 
again, and David, you well, have I'll have a quick answer, and then I think Andy should have the final word on this topic. But actually, Rick, I think, just hinted. The first question was about food. Rick answered it expertly. The second question was, you know, what can we all do to influence the legislative changes we need? And I think Rick's answer actually encompassed that as well, because he, he talked about if enough people want something, the market reacts to it. I'm always tempted to think about the height of the Atkins craze. There was no legislation. There was no act of Congress. There was no policy that required every supermarket in the country fill up with low-carb foods. Now, leaving aside the fact that most of this was low-carb, high-calorie crap, that's beside the point, <laughs> we wanted it, we got it, right? The demand trumps the supply. We speak about the food supply as if it's this immutable thing. If it begins here, if enough of us want what's better for us, if we know a little something about what that actually means, and if we demand it every time we interact with the commercial system, frankly, we can get a lot of this done without legislation and, and lobbying Congress. But there's a lot about health care reform. Well, there's a lot about legislation that has to change. And a particular example, which Tyra just mentioned, the Farm Bill. Um, it was two years ago at this conference in San Diego uh, when the Farm Bill was up for its uh, renewal, which happens every five years, uh, there was a lot of discussion of what could be done to change these, this pattern of subsidies that now makes uh, products like refined soy oil and high fructose corn syrup so cheap while leaving fruits and vegetables so expensive. Uh, in all the history of the Farm Bill, never once in the course of congressional debates did any representative of the healthcare community step forward and talk about the health consequences of this legislation, which if that were factored in, the cost to our, us as a society of the, of the disease management that we are forced to do as a result of this kind of cheap low quality food out there, that would greatly outweigh the benefits that the vested interests are making from the way the legislation is now set up. So in this last Farm Bill debate, for the first time, there was some effort to start a grassroots campaign to mobilize the healthcare community. It failed utterly. You know, we got nothing that we wanted. But, you know, five years, or four years from now, it'll be up again. And every year, Congress has to pass enabling legislation, which actually allocates money for the provisions of the Farm Bill. So every year, there is a chance to change this. And the fact that there was the beginnings of a grassroots movement, but it starts with being aware of it. I, mean, I have to say, from my own history, you know, as recently as like eight years ago, seven years ago, I did not know anything about the Farm Bill. You know, I thought, like most people, it had to do with people in Iowa. It didn't have anything to do with me. And one of the things people are saying is that this should be renamed the Food Bill or the Food and Farm Bill so we realize it affects all of us. It affects the environment. It affects our food choices. It affects food prices. So we, first of all, have to be aware that this legislation is out there, that it affects us, and then to learn about it and then take steps to try to change it. So just in closing, um, if you can each think of one thing that folks can leave here and do to uh, be healthier during the downturn and going forward, what would it be? You know, well, if, if we have to really just give a soundbite answer, I would say get passionate about it. The one word solution to our problem is passion. If, if everybody is in a mountain moving mood, then the mountains that have to be moved so, moved so that we become a culture of health will be. So passion is the one word answer. Uh, to embellish slightly, I do think we have to build a whole levy. Everybody should be willing to bend their back and stack a bag of sand. Learn a healthy recipe and teach it to somebody. Help implement a health promoting program in a school. If you know something other people need to know to help them pursue health, pay it forward. And you know, frankly, I think the effort to become a culture of wellness begins by any one of us reaching out to help any other of us. It, it is a huge job. We're going to get there over time. We didn't get into this mess overnight. We're not going to get out of it overnight. But it can begin here. It can begin now. And frankly, if not us, who? And if not now, when? I will sort of echo what David said. But instead of starting with the word passion, I'm going to start with the word flavor, because I think that flavor can really encourage people to, or can incite a certain amount of passion.